Hello, everybody, and welcome to Chapter Select, a seasonal podcast where we bounce back and forth between a series, exploring its evolution, design, and legacy. For Season 5, we are covering the Resident Evil franchise. My name is Max Roberts, and I am joined, as always, by Logan Moore. Hi, Logan. Oh, Max, little fishy, come (laughs) see my hook. Oh, thank you for being such good bait. Oh, my goodness gracious, Logan. We're going down south. Pretty far south, some may say. Very far south. Further south than Resident Evil 7, that's for sure. We are headed to Antarctica. So south that it almost becomes north. Unless the Earth is flat. True. It's quite possible. We are going to be talking about Resident Evil Code colon Veronica X, or just Code Veronica, as it's come to be known as uh, the Dreamcast spin-off title in the Resident Evil franchise. It is the quote... It's not really a spin-off. This is a very... This is a, a, a mainline game, absolutely, and it's also almost more important than a lot of others in this series. Well, there's honest. some fascinating history there that I definitely want to touch on, but technically, it is a spinoff in the, in the nomenclature of game titles and wonkiness. Yes. So uh, this is technically the oldest game we are playing this season. Uh, we played the Resident Evil 1 remake for GameCube and HD, so that was after code veronica as well as zero even though zero was being developed alongside code veronica for the n64 at the time so this is technically the oldest game we are playing this season and uh logan i mean to kind of cut to the chase this is god tier did you like that i was okay i was i I very much wanted to know your impressions this is a phenomenal game now you see why there has been a cult of people, myself included, screaming, remake this game, remake Code Veronica, remake Code Veronica. And they're like, no, we're going to do Resident Evil 4. And it's like, that game doesn't really need a remake. But OK, at the time we're recording this, Resident Evil 4 reviews just dropped and it's like staggeringly impressive. So like we're very, very excited to play that game, obviously. And you can hear our thoughts on that at the end of the season. Yes, yes. Our thoughts on that will be coming soon enough. But this is the one that I feel like is very much poised to get a remake and uh, we'll have a discussion about it in the legacy part of this episode but the short of it is is it needs to be the next remake yes and if they do something like remake five it'd be so bizarre it's like (sighs) barely a little over 10 years i guess we're like 15 years removed from five now i guess which is strange but um anywho yeah, let's do the rundown, and then I I, I want to obviously get way more into your thoughts on this one because this was the one I think of all the games in the series this season that I was interested in hearing your thoughts on. It was this one because it is so much off the beaten path in the larger series to some degree, but it is of utmost importance at the same time. There's just a lot to break down here. So anyway, uh, this game was once again developed and published by Capcom, but it did have, as Max has noted here, uh, some additional it, development partners from a lot well, of various companies. It was not developed by Capcom. It was published by Capcom, but okay. Capcom had a small part in it. So uh, go go ahead, say all the developers. Uh, uh, the developers include Flagship, Next Tech, XAX Entertainment, Capcom Production Studio 4, and then you noted Sega also helped out with this, which yeah. makes sense because this was a Dreamcast game, as we will mention next, originally. Yeah, it was, um, it basically, Flagship is like an independent Japanese developer that has a lot of funding from Capcom, Nintendo, Sega, so it kind of gets all this funding over there. Uh, I think primarily Capcom, though, so it's like a little spinoff indie studio, essentially. Then, so they saw like the scenario and game direction, but Next Tech handled all the technical stuff. Capcom Production Studio 4 did art direction and character design, and XAX assisted with the environments. And then Sega helped optimize it for the Dreamcast. So this is very much a lot of cooks in the kitchen making this game. But out of all the games we're playing this season, it's the only one that was not directly developed solely by Capcom, which is interesting to me. Yeah, I think um, I have to. We'll have to note this on our Resident Evil Four remake episode, but I'm pretty sure that one started as an externally developed game as well. To I some remember degree. hearing something about that. 
I don't know if Capcom's ever confirmed as much because the game was not formally announced when all that right. conjecture was going around. Um, but supposedly that one started out at an external studio as well. And then they were like, this isn't great. We're going to bring it in house now. Thanks for your help, though. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll talk more about that with uh, RE4 Remake. As mentioned, originally came to Dreamcast. It later uh, also ended up releasing on PlayStation 2, GameCube. And then it has been uh, re-released on PS3 and 360, which are then forward compatible as well on PS4 via the PS2 version which is w what we played. I played it on. I played the PS4, the PS2 version via Correct. PS4, or whatever the re-release. The thing. PS3 and 360 versions, though, are not the same thing. They are not. The PS4 version is PS2 emulation, which is what yes. we did. But yeah. the PS3 and 360 actually got proper HD remasters with widescreen support and other optimizations. Uh, there was a. IGN did they remove tank controls? Let's find out. I don't believe so. So trophies and achievements, sure, which are in the PS2 emulated version. Saves are stored on the hard drive. There are minor graphical changes, including high resolution menus and textures. So it's really just some polish. It doesn't sound like they removed tank controls based off what I've read here. It's just, it is a different version than what we played, which is interesting that I didn't really hear about it until final prep for this show. It's kind of funky. That it's a digital only on those consoles, never brought forward in any manner. Very much so. Uh, the game originally released on February 3rd, 2000 for Dreamcast. The later versions, we don't have release dates for those because it doesn't really matter. Uh, the game was directed by Hiroki Kato. The producer, King himself, Shinji Mikami, produced this one. And then the music was done by Takeshi Miura, uh, Hijiri Anze, and Sanai Kasahara. Uh, the Metacritic score on this one was quite impressive on the Dreamcast front when it first released with a 94 out of 100. Uh, the PS2 re-release was an 84 out of 100. And then you also put the GameCube one here, and I want to, which scored at a 62 out of 100 aggregate score. I would like to note, though, the GameCube version re-released much later than the other versions, I believe. And if you go look through yes. most of the comments from what people said, they're like, this hasn't aged well. This isn't good. Because it would have, yeah. I think, re-released after... Uh, Four. remake came out re1 remake i believe okay it would have been part of that those wave of games that they brought to gamecube when they re-released uh, obviously re1 remake and then they two also ported over three. two and three and this um so i think just by comparison of like where the series was heading and how it was getting better people were like this sucks now yeah it was shocking to me actually how how harsh some of the critics are yeah it, it's yeah, well, like G4 TV gave it a 20, and the quote on Which would have been a one out, it would have been a one out of five, five on their yeah. scale. Yeah. In the end, it's almost physically painful to try and wade through this game, especially if you've already played it in its previous incarnations. It just seems so harsh for something, like, the, the mindset critically around this re-release was, if it's not new and updated and fresh, it's old and outdated. Like, we, it seems like the, community I mean, quickly discarded old games well this this explains why re1 remake was done within a span of like what five years like that game was remade very quickly like nowadays if somebody would if i mean it kind of happened most recently this past year with the last of us which got a remake what nine years after the original years, release yeah. of the game and people were like this is ridiculous this is asinine why, why would Naughty Dog do point. this and now, back then, Capcom was like, we're remaking the first game. And everybody was like, yay, this is a great choice. Good job, Capcom. So It's uh, an interesting look. I think that review score is not reflective of the game itself. I no, because it doesn't seem like it's like a poor port of it on GameCube. It is just the it's same, the same game. game. Yeah, And outlets are just like, it's the same game. And it's not good by the comparison of what we've had the past couple of years. So yeah. don't play it. Um Anyway, so, but yes, the original game itself was a 94 out of 100, which makes this, I think, maybe, is this the highest game critically in the whole series? I mean, for, I mean, I, I'm bringing this up now and we'll bring this up again on the RE4 remake episode. That game I know is clocking in at a 93 out of 100 right now on Metacritic. What was the original Resident Evil 4, though? On PS2, the original Resident Evil 4 is a 96. Okay, so Resident Evil 4 still is top dog. 
and for I know GameCube, Res- it's a '96. So yes. Uh, okay. And then the remake is a '93. Okay. But it is in this upper echelon, of course, with the Resident Evil series. Uh, I'm surprised that the X re-release for PS2 scored so much lower. It just added more content. I think again, that's probably a sign of oh, it's old. We've we've been here. Yes. We've done that, and it's interesting to see that. You know, some twenty. Resident Evil 2 remake has a 91. Uh, Resident Evil 1 remake has a 91. So this is like, those are the ones that all eclipse 90, I think, is RE2 remake, RE1 remake, uh, RE4, RE4 remake, and then this. Those are like the top five most critically acclaimed. And I, I would agree with the 94 kind of range for this game. I mean, I think that's very high, to be honest. Um, Here's... I, I obviously want to get into you, and I want to hear your thoughts on this game. I, I would like to briefly state what I do like about this game, though, and I want to see if you come in with a similar perspective. The reason I like this game, especially upon replaying it and revisiting it, is I think it hits on all the great notes of what I like about Resident Evil as a whole. It is schlocky. It is... Uh, the the puzzles all the puzzles from the old school Resident Evil type are very much in play here. Um, it, it has all the old school elements of the series, obviously, which are core to the franchise and are still present in some capacity. But it is schlocky B, B movie horror um, mixed with over the top action. I, I think of like some of the sequences later in the game where Wesker's fighting Alexia and Wesker. Like the whole end of this game is Wesker and Chris fighting for like a five or ten minute cutscene, and then Chris flies away in a jet. And it's just so over the top and stupid. I I, I just yeah. Oh, and then the uh the, the third element of what I really like about this game is like the backstory and the lore and the continued fleshing out of this world and how umbrella came to be and who are who are these important characters and why is what is up with these twins why are they here why are they important like this like storytelling that is done via text logs in the game and via uh that like i like gathering those details in all of all of these games and that's become really apparent to me the more we play these games over the course of the whole season is i think some of the best storytelling in these games are stories that get fleshed out via the documents you find scattered around the world and you piece together like what it actually is going on and why the characters that are presented in certain ways are acting the ways that they do like alfred in this game you never really understand why he has the behaviors that he does until you get a little later in the game you're reading some of the documents that like describe like how his father viewed him and stuff and how he wasn't the perfect of of the two twins he was not the perfect one it was alexia so he was like very protective of his his sister and so, anyway it, it it just hits on all the notes with b movie horror over the top action and uh the storytelling i i, I think they're in perfect conjunction with, with this game um and I, I think that's what makes it good especially for the old style of resident evil games here this game has the best story that we have played so far i yeah it is Hold on, is, I gotta ask this. Do you now like Wesker? Wesker's incredible. <laughs> God bless them for bringing him back. <laughs> I get it now. Because before, he's in Resident Evil 1, and then he's just like, oh, I'm a bad guy, and then dies, quote unquote. He just kind of, he reveals himself very late in the game, and then it's just, ty- you fight Tyrant, and it's basically over. So you don't yeah. really get to understand it. But now I get it, because they just decide to retcon that. And they do that with this Wesker report thing that was like an included bonus DVD for pre-ordering or something, which I've watched, and it's hilarious. They just roughly chop in scenes from the old games, and Wesker narrates what he was doing. Like, he was the one that saved Ada from falling in Resident Evil 2 or something, but he's also the one that made her fall. So he's like doing all this stuff to try. He was in charge of Hunk and all this stuff. So it's just super silly. I Actually, a funny anecdote is it seems that uh, the director uh kato kato Hiroki Hiroki kato. kato he uh, uh in one instance claims that he just wrote that while extremely intoxicated so like the wesker <laughs> report stuff is just totally made up on the fly it seems that's great that's what i love like it's it, so it is uh, yes but the twins are 
just god tier kojima style characters that's what i love about this it's so he's like uh, the the idea it's alfred right is the brother yes yeah alfred at first i thought had multiple personality disorder it but kind just, of does but sort kind of, of. I, I think if they remade it that's what it would be described as instead of just a cross dresser which is yeah. what is in the game that does which feel what, a bit dated i think claire even says something you cross dressing like, freak yeah, yeah that feels extremely outdated today yeah not 2023 at first i was like oh my gosh there are no twins it's multiple personality disorder oh, like no. that's but then, that's why i was being very careful when we were midway through the game i was like have you gotten to this scene with wesker yet and you're like i think so this happened and i'm like you've not seen what i'm referring to so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say anything yet and then you get to the the midpoint of the game where the disc would switch over and you find out that Alexia is in like a cryo tube. And at that moment, I thought that Alfred was growing like a new version of his sister. But it, but through those documents you're talking about, she injects herself with the queen, the Ver, T. Veronica virus, which is just the stupidest name for a disease <laughs> ever. It's named, it's named after their great, great ancestor in- of their lineage, though. Exactly. The original, the original Ashford. Uh, which is so good. <laughs> so she's been in like a cryo state for 15 years to become like this queen ant monster. Yeah, you read thing. her. You read her own like research documents, and she's like, "Oh, I'm gonna inject myself with this, but I'll have to go to sleep because it takes a long time to implement. So I'll have to be in ca- catasto- er, 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 cry- cryo sleep for 10 or 15 years so that my powers can develop." <laughs> it's like, and, and why what? does she come to that conclusion? Because they decided to experiment on their dad, who is one of the bosses that you fight so there's this a big man with an axe down in the basement but also (laughs) silliness to it all that is just it is a perfect marriage of all these things and it's a world and a lore that i want to be immersed in and then you've got their father who has ties to the uh to umbrella you've got their mansion layout which is similar to the layout of the spencer mansion itself uh you learn about their father whose name i forget um i don't it doesn't really matter uh, their father and his relationship with Spencer, and he's like, "Oh, Spencer's an idiot," and uh, like y- you learned that like Spencer is not that this important of a character within the larger Resident Evil history as you once thought, because the real like uh, ma- machinations behind what Umbrella would become more stemmed from the Ashford family and their own research and things like that. And uh, Spencer kind of like co opted a lot of this for himself. Um, yeah, it is <laughs> wild and so much fun. It kept me engaged from start to finish. And it's a story that the series really hasn't matched up to this point as we've been playing. I get now where a lot of the goofy stuff we see later, I think right now, like Village, the fact that Ethan's hand gets chopped off and then can just be reattached. Like that's a very goofy thing that makes sense within the world i suppose but i feel like it really truly starts here i feel Mm -hmm. like because the formula this is the first game after the raccoon city incident so this is where the scope finally starts to broaden uh to where it then starts to become like a world travel video game series because then you've got four which is in eastern europe spain you've got five which is in africa you've got six which is all over the world this yeah. game's obviously in Antarctica. Like this, as soon as they got out of Raccoon City, they're like, "Cool, we're traveling the globe now, and we're gonna explain how Umbrella didn't only impact Raccoon City but the whole planet." As a result, it's um, it's so much fun. It is the most engaging thing, and I think because the formula of Resident Evil is so established by this point, right? It's been going on for five, six years, I think, at this point. Mm-hmm that's when they could spread their wings narratively. And like you said, they've left Raccoon City, so they're spreading their wings there. But also, they can just start creating these crazy worlds and lores. I feel... And then you have to think of what was out at the time. What was out while this game was in development? Metal Gear Solid was out. Ocarina of Time, not saying that like they're copying Zelda here, but I do see a lot of Metal Gear Solid in this game, narratively, structurally the flow of the game, the characters, the places. 
I even wrote in my notes a little Castlevania, more the backtracking kind of aspects of it, a little bit of the sound. There's like a lot of secrets in this game, more so than mm-hmm. the others that you could unlock. Like I, if you never take the, like I think about the first guy that the Claire comes across to who yes. lets her out of the jail cell. Like if you never take him the lighter, then I don't, or if you never take him the- uh, Medicine. The medicine, then I don't think you can get the lock pick. And I'm pretty sure you can just continue on through the game without ever getting that stuff. Yeah. But you give, if you give him the medicine to stop the bleeding, he'll give you the lock pick, and then he later gives the lighter back to Chris, which allows him to get the submachine gun. Like, there's a lot of things like that that you would just never unlock unless you kind of knew what you were doing, or you took the time to backtrack, I guess I should say. Yeah, it is... It's a game that clearly... was The series was in a super mature state at this point, in this original incarnation of Resident Evil, And we see that, I think, extremely polished and masterfully done here. And then it also makes sense that this was the last new game, so to speak. I mean, I get there was the remakes and re-releases, but the last new game before Resident Evil 4, which was in development at this time as well. And Resident Evil 4, obviously, as we talked about, went through so many different design iterations before what it landed on originally. So it is its peak. We've we've been talking a lot about this story, so I just want to kind of wrap this up but there's a lot of things i want to dig into first off to take it back to wesker we talked a lot about like uh we didn't talk much about claire and chris's role in this game because i I really don't think they have much i don't think they have roles really they're just kind of the conduits for you to go through this story in some ways like claire's introduction into why she is here is actually kind of strange (laughs) she's just like i'm in an umbrella facility and now i'm in jail and i'm in antarctica and i'm just gonna unravel this whole mystery of what's happening around me um, and so there's not there's not as much like compelling thrust behind I would say Claire specifically Chris kind of plays the role that she plays in Resident Evil 2 which is I'm finding my sister I need to look for my sister um, I do like though early on in the game she's like I need to send a message out I'll ask Leon for help I'm like oh they're all in contact still like I forgot about that yeah actually. where she sends the email and that's how Leon gets in touch with Chris which is what sends yep. Chris to the base so they're like all homies now. It's great. But yeah, I don't I don't feel like there's too much to say about Claire and Chris specifically, but I did want to go back and touch on Wesker because I, I love that Wesker's involvement in this story is he just shows up and they're like, Wesker, what are you doing here? And he's like, I work for a new organization now. It's like, well, who? And it's like, he never says anything. He's just like, I work for another organization <laughs> and I'm here to kid. I'm here to get this, the virus the from the Veronica uh, virus. I need this virus so I can leave and blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay. So he was working for Umbrella. Now he's working for another unnamed organization. And then he ends up getting like Ada to work for him in the future. And it's, It's it, it, it doesn't make any sense. Like they just throw Wesker back in for the heck of it. And then they never really explain like, like he has goals and things, but there it's like his true motivations are never really known other than he's just like, I want the virus and that's it. And that's kind of, I kind of like how generic that is. (laughs) Like, it it works very well, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That he's just a very one note character, like, give me virus for my, for my benefactor that has hired me. So here's my thing about Wesker, particularly just in this game. I like everything that they're doing with him. It's great. My question, though, is, is why is he on the box slash start menu? Because, because he doesn't he's... show up until like halfway through the like, game. Yeah, like a third of the way through I, the game. I feel like he. Pr- 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 I the wish first he's not. I wish he wasn't on the promotional material, and it was a true surprise. Yeah, because I think that would have been great. I because I wrote in my notes, I'm like, where is Wesker? He's on the screen, but I'm about fifty yeah. percent in this game, and he's not here. And then he shows up about that midway point. The base is about to explode. Claire's got to leave. Type thing. And he has superpowers and red eyes, which are not explained in the game at all. Uh, it's just like, oh, Wesker now is like a cat man. It's just so crazy. He's got superpowers, baby. Yeah. I like I like that every scene he shows up into, or I feel like he mentions this like two or three different times in the game. Like I know he does in the first scene where he runs into Claire. He's like, your brother, Chris. I, I hate, hate Chris. <laughs> I despise. Chris. <laughs> he just keeps mentioning over and over how much he hates Chris. Yeah. The whole game. 
It's and so then that good. results in their big final battle at the end, which is so over the top and so good. And I, I, t- I texted you this after we both finished. I was like, Max, we made the right call with like how we ordered the season because this sets up Resident Evil 5 so well. Because Resident Evil 5 is absolutely just the Chris versus Wesker game. So I'm it's so very pumped now. It's very vital that you play this one beforehand because, yes, Wesker's hands... Everything that happens in this game as Fallout is it, it 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 goes directly into five. So the sequel to this game is five, pretty much. And didn't um, you say you told me before five has DLC with Chris and yep. Jill reuniting? Yep. yep, and they go after Wesker. Yeah. Oh my god, that's gonna be so good. Like that gets me amped for these games, man, because it's that goofy just engaging rivalry <laughs> Japanese storytelling that we're getting here with like this American action flair and it's so fun. And that's why we're playing this because it's fun. And but then there's I'm, the I'm pumped. I think the best part of the game by far and the best story and the best moment in the entire story and the thing I was looking forward to you seeing is the moment where obviously Wesker is aligned with Chris and Claire to some degree because he wants the T Veronica virus, which means he has to go up against Alexia who uh, Chris and Claire are also going up against. So the best scene in the whole game is where all of the characters merge in the one centerpiece of the mansion, which and is then just, just like an the all out mansion. brawl starts. <laughs> well, yes, and just all out brawl. It's more like Chris is hiding. Well, and... Chris is Chris is hiding, and Alexia and Wesker go at it, and Chris is just kind of staring in a corner, <laughs> watching this f- unfold. And it's it's great. It's so it's fun. one of the greatest fight sequences choreographed <laughs> in old school video games. And then Wesker just leaves. He's like, "You can handle the rest. Goodbye." <laughs> yeah, he just runs away. I do think this is a good spot to mention one thing about the visuals in the game. I know this isn't our graphics particular discussion, but there are two types of cutscenes in this game. There are the in-game cutscenes, and then there are the CGI cutscenes that were pre-rendered. Mm-hmm. And in the year of our Lord 2023, uh, the in-game cutscenes hold up way better than the CGI cutscenes. And I know CGI was so cool back in the early 2000s, and that's why it was exciting to have all this stuff, you know, Claire running through a secret base in Paris or London, whichever one she was at, I forget. Uh, but, you know, that fight in the helicopter. Getting dumped Antarctica. Yeah, so there's some silly CGI cutscenes that just have not aged well visually, but I really do like the in-game cutscenes, and I kind of wish those had stuck, like those were more prominent in the game. Obviously, if this game is remade, that won't be an issue. Everything will be the same level of asset and visual fidelity yeah. across the game. So, But I, that was something I noticed there because that scene is so great. And I think if it was a CGI cutscene, it would diminish the awesomeness of that particular moment. I even yes. think there is a little CGI cutscene, correct me if I'm wrong, with Alexia walking down the stairs and like she catches on fire and turns into... I think the, it's when she first reveals like her true form or whatever. Right, yeah. but that is a CGI cutscene where all her clothes are burning off, yep. right? Yep, yep, I think yeah. so. See, that didn't age as well, but then her walking down the stairs in-game before the fight holds up still to this day. So an interesting thing 20 years later. What did you think? I just got to know, what did you think in that moment when that happened and you realized that that fight was going to break up between those two? I was just like, what's happening? Like, it's just kind of soaking it up. Like, she's just on fire all of a sudden. It was just. Yeah, because it's where she reveals her true powers. Like, she's not just a lady who controls a big tentacle that blasts out of the ground nonstop. Yeah. Because that's all she'd really been up until that point. She reveals her true form and her true powers. And then Wesker's like, okay, now I will fight you with my fist and glowy eyes. It's pretty cool. It's a great it's a great moment of this game. It's one of my favorites. As far as I, we talked about a lot of the story character stuff here. I don't know how much. Did you have anything else you wanted to say about Chris or Claire specifically too much in this? Those I, two? I really, no. It's no. nice to finally have them come together, I guess yeah, I will say. There's... Following the events of up to and i feel like it's nice to finally have chris get thrust in the spotlight a little bit more especially because everybody feels like re1 is a lot of people think re1 is jill's game more than it is chris's um i feel like if you ask resident evil fans that most would say jill's is the more iconic of the two runs in the original jill sandwich evil. baby yeah so 
I feel like Chris finally gets some time in the spotlight here, and it's good. And like I said, it sets up five well. Um, sets up his presence in the larger series because he's really like the main character of the series to some degree. Um, well, he's one he's of in, the. I w- he's one of the. He is, but he's in, sure. he, he's in, he's in one. He's mentioned a lot in two, obviously, and then sure. he's in this Code Veronica, and then he's in five. five he's in six, six. He's in seven, seven. He's in eight. Is he in seven? He shows up at the very, very end. Remember, he's like, "I'm Redfield," and then oh, there's yeah. the DLC with him and the that you DLC, can play with you, and then obviously he play. is in Village for sure. That is yeah. a big part. So he's like, he's in more of these games than anybody, anybody else. else. Yeah. yeah, huh? We we need to talk about one character in particular. Yes, we do. That's this is why I asked if you wanted to say anything else about Claire or Chris before we bring up the one other character that we have not touched on yet. Steve. Steve is the lone bad element of this. Or well, he's he's the he's the sore thumb of this game. He's very 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 bad. And he he's the worst character. Sticks out like a sore thumb. He's the worst character in the Resident Evil series that I think we have encountered so far. Oh, bar there's none. some it's there are some bad. bad ones in there are some bad ones in six too. So prepare yourself for that. Um, okay. Uh, but yes, yeah, Steve is absolutely <sighs> the worst character I think we've seen in the series. He's. He has like a total brat vibe early in the game. Like, uh, ha ha ha, give me a cooler gun and then I'll share these Lugers with you. He 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 he, chase me pretty lady. Um, but really, quite frankly, Steve's creepy. Steve. Yeah, Steve's got like rapey vibes. He's totally cool raping Claire. Totally tries to do it on the plane. He really, this is, but I'm going to read here's this. The, here's the I'm weird thing release, is like Claire, I, Claire then acts like she like loves him at the end of the game when he dies or doesn't die. Yeah, I, don't I don't know. know. Whatever. Wesker steals his body. It's so we- It's weird. This is what I wrote. <laughs> this is verbatim, Logan. Steve releases toxic gas because he is checking out dad ass. Like, he's the worst. <laughs> he literally yes. puts them in danger because he can't stop checking Claire out. It's he's it's a really bad really dated writing i honestly feel like it would be pretty cringe back in 2000 uh he is a lot of the reading i wrote is he was designed visually after leonardo dicaprio which i guess (laughs) he's like got dicaprio the influence of titanic yeah so i i guess he also his hair changed between code veronica and code veronica x probably more to adapt to that it's just Steve is rough, really rough. Well, but... he has no like character. His whole character is I want to make out with Claire and then they and then randomly out of nowhere they try to give him like some depth of some sort when he, he like blows away his dad. Yeah, he like <laughs> annihilates annihilates his dad who is by the way right next to claire it's a miracle who is by the way on top of claire and then he unloads full clips of some two submachine guns into him (laughs) it's really goofy there but but that's also like kind of why i love this these games it's it's like i see that i'm like what are what's going on here and then his uh his death you know the transformation into a big green monster and his his quote unquote death before Wesker, I guess somehow kidnaps his takes his body away. I feel like he's like, I love you, Claire. Which, by the way, there's no time for love to develop in all of this. All yes. of this is like what he really was saying was, Claire, you're hot. Um, I but then think Claire is like boohoo in her eyes out. It's like, oh, Steve, Steve. And it's like, okay, yeah, it's whatever. I. <sighs> If they were, I'll say this: Steve if they were to, need to be majorly reworked in, in a, a remake. remake. Yeah, I was gonna say that the way that I would compare this is again, we have not played RE4 remake just yet, but I do know in that game, uh, is it Luis? Luis? Uh, yeah. He has been added to the game more prominently, and that's just based on all the trailers and stuff we've seen. He's in sections of that game that he is not in in the base game. So they have given him a larger role. <laughs> and with this game, I think they should give Steve less of a role if they were to go back and remake this one. I think they should do the opposite um, because he just, he's, yeah, he's atrocious. Like, I I don't want him, I, I, like, every scene he's in is annoying. He's just, 
I, I, yeah, I, I just don't understand what like he's sort of bad. purpose he serves. And what sucks is so much of his, so much of Claire's time in this game and her sections center around him. Like once you get to playing as Chris about two thirds of the way through the game or so, like Steve's kind of out of the picture for the most part, which is nice. Thank goodness. And then Chris's whole task ends up being, you know, getting Claire and saving her and stuff. But a lot of Claire's section hinges on Steve and it's not good it's, at all. It's harsh and... I think, but I do have to say the fact that we love this game so much, despite the blight that Steve really is on everything, uh, speaks to the quality of everything surrounding him, that he can't even bring it down that far. You know, he kind of gives me a little bit of Johnny vibes from Metal Gear Solid 4, where it's like, I'm pooping in the... <laughs> in my outfit <laughs> kind of yeah time to marry in love with mariel yeah time to marry her last character i did want to bring up quickly is alfred because i feel like we've talked about alexia a little bit more than alfred alfred i think is very over the top and very like conversely like i would say both steve and alfred in this game are over the top and just kind of like the characters that stick out is like what is, what is going on here but alfred i think alfred's better works. Though. Yeah. Yes, Alfred works because Alfred comes across as a crazy person, but at the same time, he's been holed up in this <laughs> Antarctic castle base alone. for the past 10 years alone, protecting the cryo sleep tank of his sister. <laughs> so like him being a little, a little psychotic and a little... <laughs> like he is the whole game i think plays and makes sense yeah i like alfred and 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 i like that he i like through a lot of the like supporting documentation and stuff you can tell that he's kind of uh kind of yeah he kind of struggles playing second fiddle to his six his sister but he also like submits to her because he knows that she's like the superior twin i um, wrote i wrote uh early on creepy twins give me lannister vibes yes like, it's almost a creepy love for your sibling type yes. angle here, which probably could be fleshed out in a remake as well, more to that mm -hmm. type of thing. It's He's really good. He's a really good character here, and I like he's, it a he's, lot. He's a good character for the first half of the game. He would not hold it up throughout the whole game, which is why his sister becoming Takes the primary over it, which is a good, a good switch. Yep. It's, it's all a very good, a great moment. When we saw the Resident Evil movie in theaters, there was a point in that yes. movie where they tease the twins. And I was like, oh, they're the twins. And you're like, I don't get it. And I'm like, you would. Oh, y'all, Code Veronica. <laughs> I'm like talking about it. Like now you know why. Yeah. Because this yeah, is I, like, I get it. I would be very excited to see them show up in future. Because they were as like, well. weren't they? Doesn't it explain in the game that they weren't born of like, like they didn't have Natural. a mom? They were like, yeah, in they were tube. like. They're test tube babies. They're test tube children made by their father. Yeah, which is that he was even trying to more creepy, funky yes. layers. There's so much. There's so much cool narrative depth here, and just silly, crazy ideas that are put out. Last story. Last story moment. I want to ask you, and then I want to kind of start breaking down the world and gameplay and stuff like that. How do you feel about Chris's introduction in this game? Just scaling up the side of a cliff. <laughs> yeah, and I got some beef. I got some again. I don't know when this movie would have come out. But Chris, why was the bag not cross strapped? You know, that's what I want to say. Why was the bag not cross strapped? What what bag? He has a bag while climbing, assuming oh, yeah, carrying yeah, yeah. all his gear, and then he drops it all into the ocean, which explains why Chris has a nothing oh, yeah, yeah. when you get up to the top. That's right. I forgot. He's about a stars that. member. Should have been cross strapped. All I'm going to say. Uh, I got very big. <laughs> Mission Impossible Tom Cruise vibes from this. Now, Mission Impossible, Mission Impossible 2, 2 would have come out actually later that year, May 24th of 2000. So it, it's Maybe not Tom a direct Cruise showed Capcom a secret early screening of possibly. the film. Yeah, yeah. There's big Tom Cruise energy. It's... Goofy. I just like that that's how... I just like that that's the transition. It cuts from them being in the snowmobile but getting blasted by the tentacle and then the next thing you see is Chris climbing the side of a mountain. I like that Chris <laughs> misses them by moments. Like, yes. they, he shows up right after the base is blown up and Claire and Steve have just left. So it's just this total mismatch 
miss of everything. That's another great thing about this game. I mentioned that, like, in the same way that, like, in every Bioshock game, there oh, the, there's a lighthouse or whatever. There's always a lighthouse. In Resident Evil, there's always a self-destruct sequence. And in this game, there's two of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's very good. There was one thing I wanted to say about Claire. That uh, just came Crap. back to me. Uh, her design in this game, I think, again, the product of the times. They just, for whatever reason gave her a crop top they're like i got a belly button in antarctica mm. i'm like that feels pretty dated because her well, design she was a- in paris come on i guess or wherever but, she was <laughs> but I, that feels pretty dated especially i think her design in resident evil 2 even the original is just more iconic with the full jacket and you know yeah. just the look so i would be excited to see a more Oh, her cooler design quite frankly come back in a remake as well she did feel a bit dated in this game visually speaking how did you um this can kind of get into more the structure of the game and we'll, we'll talk about the world and stuff like that but to kick off that discussion i did want to ask you of these older games this is one of the ones outside of three that doesn't have dual playthroughs, but it still kind of sticks close to that model by putting dual protagonists in the center and they still traverse the same avenues and stuff like that. And not only that, but there's stuff in this game like if you don't pick up certain items as Claire when you're running through, you can pick them up later as Chris and things like that. Like there's a lot with this game structure and how it's designed that I think is cool. And it is a natural evolution of the dual character runs that you can play from the earliest Resident Evil games. How did you feel about that? This time around, especially because I know we have not been playing the set, the alternate campaigns, or at least in just Resident Evil 1. I know we did it in 2 Remake. Um, but yeah, how did you feel about that sort of decision here? Because it's clear that that, that, that decision with this game is um, stems from what they did in the previous entries. Yes. This is exactly what Ricky alluded to us in our Resident Evil 2 episode. They fix the problems that I have with these dual protagonist runs that are separate and not having the world feel lived in the same Mm -hmm. occupying the same space this is the same space for both characters and it's actually super cool that when chris comes to the first island it's in the destroyed state so you're familiar with where to go but avenues and paths are blocked off because of the destruction and if you do leave items behind as claire chris can get to some of them if you kill the worm as Claire, I, my understanding is you don't have to fight it as Chris later. Uh, that may not be true because the other guy still, well, no, he would just die, I think. I think what I read yeah. was he just dies of, of his wound or something. So it's interesting that the world is lived in and feels like the same space for both characters. It's also important the items that you drop in the item box. I, I screwed this up actually, but the items that you drop in the item box before you go fight the the zombified version of their dad or whatever with the sniper, like if you happen to be carrying the grenade launcher, because that was the thing that screwed me up. I had the grenade launcher on Claire in yeah. my run. And so then as Chris's run, I was picking up all these all the grenades and acid rounds and stuff. I'm like, I'm like, I can't even use it because this is all on Claire at the moment. It's super cool and super smart. I will say I played with a guide. I just was like, it's old. I did too. I just want to breeze yeah. through this. Uh, so the guide gave me that heads up and whatnot. I did. I did. I did as well. Yeah. Because it was, it was one of those ones where uh, we, we've just been playing these fun. games. We've been playing these games on a bit of a time crunch too, or not a, we're not crunch for time necessarily, but I, I want I want to make sure that I'm moving through them at a good pace. So that's kind yeah. of why I've been consulting a guide while I play through. It's I really love that part of the world design and reusing spaces and having destruction be a part of it. If it, it truly feels alive, it's probably the most alive place in these old games that truly feels connected. Yeah, I think the all these games have always done really phenomenal jobs of their locations their locations i think are what set these games all apart actually i'm looking at my notes here's a great example of this i think is when you're chris you have to go get the army proofs that claire uses to get the jet you have to get them to unlock the the secret lab or whatever Mm -hmm. and so it is it forces you, you know where you have to go. So you have to navigate back through the world, but solve some puzzles a different way because things have changed. 
There's it's a big really hole in good. the ground now. And, yeah, it's uh, strategic and cre- makes old spaces feel new. And I really loved that. And the objective was clear and just, uh, it's so good. Great design. And great, great like, design. I remember there are things, like I said before, about the items and stuff like that. Like, I remember seeing certain items. I'm like, I don't know how I can get that. Like, how how do I reach that? How do I get there? And then, like, uh, I go back through later and, like, the environment's slightly different. Like, I think of one of the... Uh, one of the briefcases that's trapped behind the cage in yeah. the Antarctic base near the end. I, I was trying to get that as clear. I'm like, I don't know how to get this. Uh, maybe later I'll try to come back. And then as I go through with Chris, it's destroyed. And it's like, oh, well, there we go. Now I can get it. It's so good, stuff it's like that. Great, they, they, it's good design. Good world design yes. for sure. How do you feel about all the different locations in this game? Because we've got the opening jail slash military base, which kind of then leads to uh, the Twins Palace. And then we've got the... Um, the house and the, the final Antarctic base where yeah. everything takes place there at the end. How, how do you feel about the different environments in this game and kind of how they play off of, especially the final locale, how it plays off the Spencer Mansion and stuff as well, which I know we've already talked about to some degree. The, it, military base is an interesting start, I think. I thought, I thought the palace was going to be where we spent most of our time. And you do spend time there, but really you're bouncing around places quite often. There's even a yeah. submarine for some reason that connects to like an underwater base. But it's, did you like that the military base is established as like the main military base where all the umbrella people train, including Hunk? It's did where you find. Yeah. Did you find that document? I found Where's a document it? from Hunk, I believe. Yes. And I think I, he mentions the military base and how he used to train oh, there or something like that. Okay. That's super cool. See, cool world building. So the, that's cool. I like the palace because it immediately gives you that Resident Evil vibe, but it's not creepy. And then the house on the hill is creepy. But I think we yes. don't spend enough time there. It's in the really, house on the hill? Yeah. It's go upstairs, yeah. do secret puzzles in the bedroom, come there's downstairs. The, yeah. And then you go upstairs and there's the, like the, carousel or whatever up there too and that's about it yeah it's just i feel like there's potential in that house that wasn't tapped into and then secret antarctic base like with spencer mansion slightly recreated in it it's cool and goofy cool literally because it's antarctica so i'm i'm fond of it all of these places feel good they're contained not too expansive easy to remember where you need to go the map is actually like sort of useful ish kind of mm-hmm. probably the first especially for one of the older ones yes. yeah uh, an actual useful map so appreciate that i like it it's a good world that feels properly fleshed out without being too cumbersome i like the final antarctic base Like, it hasn't been blown up yet, so the reason they explain how things are different when you get there with Chris is just kind of like that Alexia has taken control of everything and has, like, done some remodeling (laughs) to some degree, and that's how things are a little bit shaken up over there. Yeah, I think, uh, I will say I don't think there are as many specific iconic locations in this game compared to some of the other ones we've played. There is no equivalent of the police station. There is no Spencer Mansion every there there's a lot more it's a lot more interconnected than i think some of the other resident evil games we have played are and you are backtracking more often and you are going you're traversing the whole world in this game a bit more than a lot of the others and so in a lot of ways that makes it much more unique and you feel like you are covering a like when i just say where this game takes place i just think of antarctica kind of broadly like i don't think i don't have one specific spot in mind but i think that's different like to the game's benefit like you don't need a one-off location in every resident evil game if If you really in a way kind of similar to re3 where re3 really is just raccoon city and then a hospital underground base like two separate locations so and these games were being built and made at the same time so there could be some crossover there I think this is a better world in an exploratory sense. Resident Evil 3 is very much beeline straight through not really exploring spaces. But this is a very good, just explorable world in mm-hmm. in that scope without being too big. Coming off of like the world design, I wanted to also ask you about the gameplay in this one, which 
is old school Resident Evil for the most part. But uh, what I specifically, I guess, wanted to ask you is um, if you can clearly see how Resident Evil 4 came after this. Because this game, more than any of the others, uh, lets you do combat pretty regularly and i don't feel like you're ever strapped for ammo as much as you are in some of the other games i didn't know if that's how it was in your own experience but i do know i got to the end of this game and i knew i was heading into the final boss fight and i looked what i had in my item box before i went to go fight the final boss and it was a whole lot of ammo that i was sitting on for mm-hmm. all my weapons and i was not not using my weapons throughout the game too like i was pretty heavily firing away at zombies and other enemies whenever I saw them. Um, So it wasn't a situation where I was trying to be conservative. But this game, and this is a progressive change that we see in all these games too. I know we didn't play the original Resident Evil 3, uh, but that game had a larger focus on combat as well rather than being more survival-based. And you still have to be careful with how you allocate your resources. But yeah, I guess broadly when it comes to shooting and killing zombies and stuff in this game did you find that it also it very much pushes you to use your weapons go nuts we're gonna give you ammo pretty regularly in this yeah absolutely i wrote down this is definitely the most actiony old school resident evil game and it makes sense that four is the next step from this embracing that but giving us that over the shoulder camera angle while maintaining the tank controls so it's a logical next step up um it definitely is. I see that and felt that, experienced it quite a bit. I will say, though, I thought the weapon variety was not great. I think we're... I'm starting to get bored of the tried and trues in Resident Evil. I think the the bow gun was pretty cool. Very fast. Not It can hold infinite number of ammo, so they're never reloading. Oh, yeah, and you can stack it all. Yeah, so the <laughs> so you can bow, have like 400 rounds at a single time and you don't have yeah. to. Yeah. The bow gun is cool. I think the grenade launcher in this game sucks. I think yeah. the arc of the shots, like they they botched the grenade launcher. I think the shotgun is fine. The grenades work well, but I don't think the flame rounds or the acid rounds work very well or the there's gas rounds too, I think. Yeah, I just I I wasn't feeling the weaponry this time around. Also, some guns have a percentage of ammo instead of... Yes. That was odd. And I found myself not wanting to use them because I was worried I'd run out. And then I get to the end and I almost have 100% in all of them. So that was that was an interesting mindset. But with those guns, you can, you can shoot two different zombies at the same time, which yes. is really cool with those, which a is very awesome. Cool dual wielding type energy. Very dope. Mm-hmm. I like that, but I guess because I was scared to use them as a limited percentage item, I didn't really get to experience that a lot. But replaying the game, you would know that you could do that, I guess. Sure, this is true. Because you're never going to be... Like, that's what I was saying. This game is... Because it took me a bit to realize that while playing this game is like, oh, I'm not running out of ammo. Like, I'm not even pressed for it. So I'm just going to start using a pretty pretty freely here um because i think i'll be fine and i'm nearing the final phases of this game i did notice there aren't a lot of bosses in this game there's not a lot of boss fights and some of the ones that are presented are optional as well the spider was the spider is one you can avoid i think of the uh when you go down into the like dungeon basement area where the uh plaque is in the water and then that that uh, electric uh, yeah, because I just ran no. in there and grabbed the plaque after I couldn't hit the darn and thing. Just, and then you can just turn around and run back out. Yep, you don't have to fight that either. It's, I don't know how I feel about it. There are cool bosses in this game. I'd argue the dad zombie, I wrote the name down here, the Nor, Nosferatu? Nosferatu. Nosferatu. I think is actually a really iconic Resident Evil villain. Uh, the design of it with all bandaged up and tentacles and a a big ax type energy. Cool, cool boss design there. Tyrant of course shows up. I feels like just for the sake of a little recycled. Yeah. Yeah. I think Tyrant, I think this is the last appearance that Tyrant makes. And then of course, uh, Alexia and her. 
You've got the stretchy arm dudes. That oh, show the up. Bandersnatches. Yes, which are They're very annoying. Annoying, but unique. I, yes. I appreciated a little bit new variety there. And they can jump up on different levels, and that happens yeah. at multiple points in time. And that's pretty scary in that yes. accent. So cool, neat, but not a lot of boss fights. There's, no. of course, you run away from Monster Steve, which is which is horrible. By the it's way. a bad segment because you can basically have to go into that section with health or else you will die. You have to have experience. two health items yep. or get extremely lucky. And there's no, I don't know how you can outrun it to be honest. Cause I tried it and I died like twice. Yeah, I was like, Oh, is... I just have to burn through my health here. So that section sucks. It does suck. It's. And then obviously Alexia. Her. Which is a fun fight, and she gets all she turns. Mm, her. No, I like. I, I don't I like, think the final fight is fun. I well, I'll say this: I like blowing her up with the bazooka energy well, gun thing. Well, who doesn't? Because like it, that? the second you it happens, it immediately cuts to CGI. Yes, but that second, the second phase of that fight where the little bugs are just hounding you is obnoxious i will say i did not have much trouble with that because i had seven times in a row i had oh i did not die at all on her i had full magnum ready to go yeah. primed pop, shot pop, her pop, with pop, the pop, magnum pop. but those bugs i ran i would run it i had like six shots of magnum run out of that and then switch to the ak or the whatever machine gun i had oh i had that. my gra- i had like 12 grenade launcher rounds so i was just like poof 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 but those like, bugs kept killing me, man. I actually looked up a video and they were like, you just got to shoot her. Don't worry about the bugs. Yep. And I tried I tried two strategies of ignoring the bugs and shooting the bugs and both were failing up to that point. But then I was like, all right, I'm just going to shoot her forever. And I stuck with the strategy I saw in the video and it, it seemed to work. Well, it did work because then I ended up winning. But man, those bugs suck. And uh, that fight needs to be reimagined as well. <laughs> I would think that that didn't give me a problem. Uh, fortunately, I did kill her the first time. So that's just nice. dawned on me: was Claire poisoned in your run? Uh, yes, by the stupid moths, which I hate. By no, no, no. Oh, the moths suck. No, no, no. Was she poisoned by oh. Nosferatu? No. I was reading about this. Apparently, if you get too close to him in the fight, he poisons you. Yes, and then Chris has to go get. An antidote, yes. which is referenced in pickups and collectibles. Yes, it is. And it is in the basement section. And I was actually uh, looking for that because I knew about that. I was like, why am I not? Can, why can I not find this? And then when I went and saved Claire, it was just like, oh, she's fine. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's another optional section of the game. I think that's a really cool touch. And it, it directly impacts narrative and performance of the game. Again, connecting the world and it makes you want to ensure that you do a better job as in that boss fight on top of the like helipad or whatever you're fighting on there a bit too foggy up there a bit too foggy a little bit but you can definitely see the metal gear solid influence in in that fight for sure with the sniper rifle and yeah that's metal gear solid one vibes absolutely <laughs> But yeah, there's not a lot of bosses in this game, I, I like you're saying, which I, I think is kind of interesting because it is so action heavy. So it it is different in that re- regard. I, I gotta say, I hated the moths and the spiders in this game. Holy moths smokes. are atrocious. They are obnoxious. Because you can't aim at them. They're like they hover in a in a area that's like between like shooting at mid range and shooting upwards. And so yep. like you never ha- know exactly how to shoot them and then they can just latch onto your back and it's very annoying in that regard. Um, and one time I killed all of them, but was had one of their little babies implanted on my back. Mm. And so I waited in the room for it to hatch. Doesn't so hatch I could, nope, you, you have to the next leave room. the room. And then when you go back in, the moths are, moths back. are back. So it's just a really bad section there. And, it's, fr- um, it's frustrating. Yeah, yeah that, that was the that moths section I didn't suck. I did not like that section for sure. I don't think there's anything else to say gameplay wise though. I mean, did did any puzzles stand out in this game to you? Or uh, oh, I mean, I gotta ask about it. This is your <laughs> true tank control game. What are your <laughs> thoughts? At first, I was like, this is atrocious. Get me out of here. This is going to be the worst game we play. Because it's just tank controls. 
They have not aged well. It's so no. frustrating. They're bad. But because you mentioned it with Resident Evil 4, you're like, this is so bad. I'm like, Max, you don't. You'll, you'll understand. <laughs> Resident I Evil think 4 it's, is like not that big a deal by comparison. I think it's worse in Resident Evil 4 in the sense really? that Resident Evil 4 feels like it should be a third person shooter where you can walk and shoot. So tank yeah. controls don't feel natural in that setting. But yeah, the more top down approach here at least made it a little easier on my brain of just mm-hmm. up is go forward and then figuring out left and right based off and they the give you the 180 character. spin which is nice very helpful so it's which fine I and i got used to it but please no more please no more tank controls it took me about 45 minutes to an hour to get kind of used to it and i didn't have any problems after that Early on um, in the game, when you have to like run away from the dogs, I was like, "This is not good. This is a bad time. I can't." <laughs> yes, because because when you panic, your brain goes in that fight or flight, and then my brain's not thinking. Here's how we use. I definitely use the D pad. I try. And naturally, I was reaching for the analog stick at first, and that makes it even worse because you don't have any true. Oh, feel. I played the whole game with an analog stick. Oh, I know. Could not do that. I was D pad all the way. I need to know up is up and left and right or left and right. I can't have the, you know, drifting nature of a, a thumbstick. So interesting. But I got better at it and uh, I'm glad I experienced it. I have some historical context for it now, but I'm I don't want it anymore. I was afraid when we were going to come in to to record this episode you were going to say, this game's horrible. I hate Code Veronica. Tank control's bad. Like, I thought that this was going to be, like, your turning point on the series over... Maybe not turning point. Like, you hate it. But, like, I figured you were not going to adapt well. (laughs) Especially for how this one is slotted in the season, kind of, like, right in the middle. And we've played a lot of remakes, and we've played a lot of newer games, and we've played a lot of older games that are newer than this one. I, I, I thought you might struggle here. So I'm glad you we're able to enjoy this in spite of this being the oldest entry we have played. Yeah. Um, for sure. Did you, I, again, anything about the puzzles inventory system, there's nothing really to write home about this time around. I like the inventory is expandable, which I think is the first for an old game. So very exciting, very cool. The puzzles I feel are more point and clicky inspired. They're more obtuse options. There's tricks and, you know, Things that wouldn't necessarily make sense at first glance. So that it feels more point and clicky in that nation. Like a pirate ship is a key. Like a pirate ship wheel is a key. Or you have oh, to yeah, go get yeah. a painting. You have to first zoom in on a skeleton painting to get numbers to unlock a door and then take the painting into another room. So it feels very monkey islandish in that way of, you know, try odd items until they work. So that's that was one or get all the necklace crystals to you know open things later so definitely feels more like that let's uh let's touch on the horror factor of this game which is an element of all of these games um and as the series has started to become more action heavy with this one it's definitely lost the creepiness element for sure especially coming off of like resident evil 2 and 3 which are games that have people chasing you the whole time which is not really present in this in this game i think i think honestly what makes this game less creepy than the others though um is just the fact that the main antagonists are all human or humanoid for the most part like you've got obviously Mm -hmm. zombies and (laughs) mutated animals and insects like normal in the resident evil series but alexia alfred and wesker which you don't really directly fight wesker outside of cutscenes, but they're all humans in nature to some degree so th- that makes it less scary you don't have a big hulking tank with a rocket launcher chasing you around um and i think that alone kind of lowers the horror factor in this one considerably it's i wasn't scared by anything there was i was never like unsure to enter a new space I think they tried some yeah. horror stuff. I think narratively there's creepy Opening stuff. Opening the doors more slowly with the like heartbeat with yeah. with your heartbeat dun, ramping up dun, 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 dun. as your uh, controller shakes in tandem with it. I think of the doctor that was performing and had the secret lab underground. He oh, had to yes, use the yes. eyeball. He was like, no mm-hmm. one will get to my precious subjects. And obviously like the stuff that they do to their dad 
who is the boss. Like that is narratively scary, but mm-hmm. in game, not scary. It's like so, body horror stuff more than yeah, it is like jump and, scare or not. not you know, just like I, I'm not scared to play the game necessarily. It's right. gruesome and it's gross, but it's not really like I I, I, I I never felt like I was like, I got to take a break. This game is stressing me out. <laughs> Whereas like the other day I was, I mean, this will kind of time things a little bit. I've been playing through Village recently and I reached the dollhouse section of village the other day and it was like 11 30 at night and i was like you know i think i'm just gonna stop here for the night actually <laughs> yeah it's, uh, and, it, this is definitely not scary and I'm, i would be curious to see how horror could be re like reimagined into the game if mm-hmm. it was remade because i think you gotta have some scary stuff in the game like i there's so many possibilities of what they could do in a remake of but yeah, it's not as scary, which is a a bummer, but I do think it compensates it in the action and just over the top in nature of mm-hmm. everything. So it, it does feel balanced, just not, it's definitely the furthest we've come from horror. Yeah, to some degree. I mean, I think the series from here does become more action heavy for certain. Oh, um, absolutely. Four, five, six, obviously, like. It's just things only get crazier from here. And so uh, <laughs> horror is an aspect of Resident Evil and it always will be. But I do think this is where it started shaking loose from trying to intentionally scare the player. Um, whereas the older games kind of tried to do that more frequently. Let's talk about the music. Um, I think there's Ooh, actually more baby. to say about this soundtrack than a lot of others. There is yeah. ever present music in this game compared to just sound effects and stuff like that. A lot of these other games opt to be a little quiet to build a tense atmosphere and uh make you trepidatious of where you're exploring. But no, there is pretty constant music in every single area of this game. It's playing in the background constantly. There's different themes for different sections of the game. And I think the full soundtrack in this game is one of the strongest ones we've seen so far out of all of these. Absolutely. This game has such a good soundtrack. It's got this jazzy detective thriller flair to it yeah. and some of its sound effects. The theme for the twins slash Ashford yes. family is iconic. Immediately, I knew I heard this. I was like, this is a certifiable banner right here. This is the... This is the song from the game. It's so, so good. It's eerie. It's creepy. It's romantic. It's a great song. A great song. Are you talking about the song that plays like on their, uh, the music box? Yeah, like the piano theme that you hear all the time whenever they're around. It's it's great. I wrote there's good music in the the private estate, the manor on the hill there. The credits music, I wrote as bumpin, you know, cuz I've got a great musical vocabulary here. They've got the choir boss battle music coming back. It is just a really full and experimental soundtrack that I appreciate. But that jazzy detective nature of it, I'm like, "Ooh, more of this, please. Let's yeah." Give some character and texture to Resident Evil sound. Like, make it fun. Yeah, I I think them trying to, um, like we said before, not focus so heavily on um, trying to scare you. Because I think when music is playing in the background, it does kind of break that tension a little bit, and it does kind of make you feel a bit more at ease, even if things on screen are chaotic and you're getting swarmed by zombies. Just the fact that there is music there is a constant that you can kind of latch onto with audio wise. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, the music in the game is great at the same time. So I, I'm, I'm glad to see them implement it uh, a bit more heavily than some of the others that we have been playing, especially some of the others from this era of the late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, or I guess just early 2000s because we never played any of the actual games from the 90s. We deferred to some of the remakes instead. But yeah, the soundtrack in this game I, I absolutely think is one of the strongest in the whole series that we've experienced so far. Apparently there was a vinyl release of this 
and the cover art is Alexia in her like queen bug form. Oh. <laughs> that's 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 a choice for the cover. Very interesting. I'll send it to you. Pretty cool. All right, Max. We've kind of touched on it um, a handful of times, but let's talk about the legacy of this game and what it means for the larger series and how it's looked back upon. Um, you can start this one off. It, man, what a game. What a game. There's a lot of different things, like a little tidbits, I think, that make this up. It's the first big major Resident Evil game that is developed not by Capcom. I think that's really important here. There's, because this game is awesome, and it proves that Capcom's not the only one that like has cracked the Resident Evil formula. I get that Capcom had a hand in making this game, but it wasn't just them. And so, I mean, Shinji Mikami is still a producer, so anything these people are coming I up was, with, he's having to like. I was reading in, to some degree in my history book, the Itchy Tasty. He was just kind of approving things on the side. He was because at the time, you've got to think he was in on two, three, four. Like a lot was going on. He's just the producer on everything. He didn't. Yeah, he didn't direct some of those games, but he was still. He was kind of the. He was overseeing all of this. Yeah, what was going on. This game brings back Wesker, which is so vital to the future of the Resident Evil series and is a legendary character within video games. So I think that's really important. The twins, mm-hmm. the Ashfords also, as my understanding, are fairly prominent in the series going forward. I'm going to show you after this ends. I don't know if you looked it up, but the scene from that movie I was talking about. I haven't gone back. No, I should. <laughs> they, could, they directly... Uh the film uh, the reel that you find of them and he's like tearing off the bug wings or whatever. That's directly in the movie. Oh my gosh. Okay. See, that sounds so cool now. <laughs> but in the end, I think this is like the true culmination of traditional Resident Evil. It is the peak of that design. And yeah. as we've talked about through the course of the season, Resident Evil can really be kind of chunked into three different eras. The old school tank control traditional era the middle action-y era, Resident Evil 4 through 6, and then the rebirth of it all with 7, RE Engine, and this season of remakes with 2, 3, and now 4. And this is the peak, this is the end of that first era, and it hits, and it's great. Yeah. And I definitely am with the people that think this game needs to be the next one to be remade, for sure. This is... I can't believe it's not talked about more. As well, we had to go back and greats. play a version of it that is over twenty years old. Like, there's a reason this one is the oldest game we've played this year, and that that that's why I think people want this remade the most is because of all the other games. Like we've talked we've talked about how when like Capcom holds these Resident Evil sales, like the whole Resident Evil saga, one through six, zero, um, seven and eight, even like readily available across PlayStation, Xbox switch and pc this is the only one that is like gridlock to certain platforms that you have to kind of I mean, necessarily go fair, out of your way it is to play. accessible on ps4 and xbox yes, and does is. go on sale with those games it does it does it is an emulated version of the ps2 yes and actually on xbox i wonder what it is emulating because it's not the hd version so it might be the dreamcast version yes i don't know i mean that's that's what i'm saying you're playing a ps2 version of the game that is forward compatible on ps4 which you can is then also backward compatible on ps5 they did remake it on the ps3 and 360 or remastered it so they did try going forward the next generation to keep it forward but really they just haven't done anything with it since the ps4 mm-hmm. generation which was 10 years ago when it, that yeah. generation started and so it's interesting that capcom like isn't i don't want to say i mean they're proud of it but it's definitely not as accessible as the rest of them well it's just it it is a weird it's weird because to me this game's legacy is that it's it's very it's so important like this game is so vital to the larger series like i was saying it directly sets up what happens in five This is the first game that broadens the scope outside of Raccoon City. This deepens the lore. This showcases what the... uh, It gives us a first taste of kind of what this series would become with its globetrotting nature of going around to different countries and different locales and meeting different characters and figuring out the extent to which Umbrella has impacted the world. Um, I, I think this game is pivotal in what the series would 
become. And in a lot of ways, this is like, it's strange that RE4 is a mainline game because that game is pretty self-contained and doesn't tie in with a lot else that happens within the larger series. Like that, I mean, that's not really true because there are ties with five and stuff, but Resident Evil 4 is like pretty self-contained to the point that that could be a spinoff of its own just this adventure of Leon. Leon saves the president's Sp- daughter. Yeah, Leon saving the president's daughter in Spain. Like that's it's very different compared to Code Veronica, which is directly following up the events of uh, of the Raccoon City games. They're trying to still hunt down Umbrella. They're going these different Umbrella bases around the world. They're finding out more about the roots of the company and how it's again how it's a reach it started to extend to other parts of the world how the virus was born what it's what it came from uh so like yeah this game is very much like this is kind of resident evil 4 in a lot of ways like it is so it's weird that retroactively like and i know this because i've been a fan of the series for so long and i've I told you this coming into it and i think anybody else who's been familiar with this series for so long knows this as well but like when they finished remaking uh three a lot of people were like cool four next and anybody like me or others was like no code veronica next is what needs to happen like that's Mm -hmm. that is the next logical game they should look to do because it's just sequential so it's it's a spin-off that is more important than some of the mainline games strangely um this is the only non- numbered game i think we're playing in this season correct yes but now that you've played it would you agree that it's hugely more pivotal than even three and four like this game is i'm i'm so glad that you said we're playing code veronica like yes when we were building out this season's list of just games to play not even the flow necessarily but this was vital and then it also was vital in our flow discussion i like where we've put this yeah, I do too. In the season, near, I know, told you we had to play this before five because I knew just it sets up everything. It comes after us playing three, which wraps up the Code Veronica, or I'm sorry, the Raccoon City story. And this is the logical next step and leap for that coming out of RE2 and, and Resident Evil 3. So I, this game is vital. If when I go forward and I tell people to play Code or Resident Evil games, this makes the cut. This is a game to yeah. play and experience. It's awesome. It's fun. And it doesn't sound like it would. Like the game, we didn't haven't talked about this, but like the, the game name title of the is game so is awful. The game, the name of the game is so weird. Like, oh, you gotta play Resident Evil Code Veronica. It's like, what? That sounds Code like Code Veronica X. <laughs> it sounds like a game that would have released on like Game Boy Color and like no one would have ever thought twice about 25 years ago. Yeah. But it's like, no, this is like one of the like of the games in the series that are the most important to the overall Resident Evil universe and lore. So, like this is like very, very high on the list. Yeah. So yeah. And I, I think that's this the game's legacy in my mind is that. This is a linchpin in the larger series. So much of what Resident Evil would later become is kind of a turning point here, not only in terms of mechanics, like we mentioned how it's more action-oriented, but also the story sets the stage for where things go following Raccoon City. Like, this game is hugely important, and that's kind of its legacy to me, is that it is the one of the most important games of the series that is not numbered at all, which yeah, is which is crazy. funny. All right. I think that does it for Resident Evil Code Veronica X. Thank you all so much for listening. If you'd like, you can check out the rest of our seasons over at chapterselect.com. We've got stuff like The Fast and the Furious or God of War, uh, The Last of Us. You know, that show just ended as we're recording this. So, Uh, Plenty of shows to explore and seasons there. If you'd like to follow Logan, you can do so over at Moreman12 on Twitter and his work over at comicbook.com. If you'd like to follow me, you can go to maxfrequency.net. All my writing is there and my other podcast, the Max Frequency Podcast. So go check that out. Thank you all so much for listening. And until next time, adios. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. All right, I gotta go pick up my kid. Chapter Select is a Max Frequency production. This episode was researched, produced, and edited by me, Max Roberts. Season 5 is hosted by Logan Moore and myself. 
Season 5 is all about Resident Evil. For more on this season, go to chapterselect.com forward slash season 5. Follow the show at chapterselect and check out previous seasons at chapterselect.com.